You're watching the Pick TV Network, Channel 1000. Welcome to the importance and power of reading. I'm Michelle, the computer lady, your host. During some awful dark times in America, black people were denied the ability to read, to learn how to read, to write, or to even own books. And that has hampered our communities up until this day. Now we're going to have important conversations about the importance and power of reading. Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle, the computer lady, and welcome to this edition of the importance and power of reading. Today, I have an amazing, fantastic, dynamic guest, Dr. Lane Rowling, MD. He has six and three quarter degrees. He has teaches at two colleges, specializes in microbiology, infectious disease medicine, he was a trauma surgeon, and he's a veteran. This guy is amazing. Dr. Rowling, thank you so much for joining me today. <laughs> I just love you and all the things that you've done. Tell everybody more about who you are. Well, well good morning, uh, Michelle, and thank you for that, that warm introduction and stuff like that. Well, you know, I, I hate talking about myself because I, I always want to be reserved and uh, be humble and stuff like that. But I think sometimes now in our age of our society now, we have to let people know what our credentials are to have credibility. And credibility sometimes is not about, you know, what you what you say is what you do. And you got to let people know, you know, what type of individual you are, what type of individual you are. Well, I'm a, I'm a doctor. Um, I have six degrees. I have, uh, you know, two degrees in uh, microbiology and a degree in uh, chemistry, a minor in military science. I have a master's degree in molecular biology, and I have two doctor degrees. I'm, I'm board certified in uh, surgery. I did my residency training in surgery in Honolulu. I'm an infectious disease specialist, and I did my postgraduate uh, infectious disease training in Peru for two years. And I teach all over the world uh, from the, uh, the laboratories in Germany uh, to the jungles of Peru and in, into the classrooms in the United States. And I look forward to having a good conversation with you this morning. This is stunning and it's going to be epic. If you folks don't know who Dr. Lane Rowling is, you really need to look him up. If you're on Instagram, he has coffee with the doc and he's always giving out vital information to keep us safe. He's a trusted physician. If I want to know anything about what's going on in the United States, what's going on in the world about infectious medicine, this is my go-to man right here. This guy right here. He is absolutely amazing. Now, let's get into some of these questions I have for you. Because as a young person, did you like to read? Did you like school? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, my mother was very influential uh, as, a, as a young uh, black male, you know, growing up, you know, I guess I, I guess we call it baby boomers because I was born in 1964. But I remember uh, my mom always talked about uh, reading and education from a young age. As far as I can remember, four, four years old, five years old, six years old, she always strived that. And I kind of got an understanding of why that was so important, especially for uh, black uh, males at that. I mean, our society, because my grandmother, uh, my great grandmother could not even read. I mean, she was born in 1900, uh, Victoria, Baltimore, Baltimore. She couldn't read. Uh, she read uh, 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 the first generation uh, 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 culture in that, culture in that in education here in America. And it was true that education back then was it was definitely uh, separate and it was def definitely unequal. I.e., my mother was that first generation born in 1944 to be able to have that opportunity to leave and learn how to read, uh, and she did that. My, she was a young kid, six, seven, eight years old, reading my grandmother's prescription medications or reading my grandmother's letters and stuff uh, because she couldn't read, and that showed you such a divide in our society, and so it always makes my heart sing because uh, my grandmother great grandmother couldn't read my mother was valedictorian out of her school in louisiana you can google that from 1964. my mother ended up becoming an rn nurse and then i become a doctor and my sister becomes a doctor but at the end of the day reading and she's always strived education back in the early 70s for us in a time of big time transition here in the united states in education and civil rights 
Well, that's absolutely correct. And that shows you the importance, not only of reading, but knowing your history. Because with grandma, a lot of people couldn't, you, you weren't even allowed to read. Or if they wanted you to read, they didn't want you to be smart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's why these, these topics are so poignant. Well, I mean, it's now, very important because I know one of the things when my, my uh, grandmother, they were, they were picking cotton, cotton in Louisiana. And um, I had, my mother wanted to go and do what everybody else did to help out with the family. And my grandmother would say, hey, no, you're, you're not, you're not going to come out here picking cotton. You're going to go to school and learn. And my mother ended up, you know, learning and becoming valedictorian, you know, a class president, the whole nine yards out of Oakdale, Louisiana. And she wanted to go to Southern or she wanted to go to uh, Grambling because uh, these were the only two schools that were available in Louisiana for uh, black folks back in them days. But my mother did what she needed to do and ended up becoming a nurse and stuff. So, but at the end of the day, yeah, the, the understanding education and reading was a critical, critical area. And we have to stimulate people young. I know for me at five and six years of old, when I was reading books, I even started reading comic books. That was my go-to things, the, the, and my science fiction books. And you know, when I get to comic books, I would read at five and six and I wanted more and more and more. And I found out what I learned from my mom that for some black folks, especially my mother from the South, Louisiana, she used to tell me, her books was her gateway to the world. She could go any place in the world back in the 50s and the 60s because she read. She could see herself in Europe. She could see herself in Africa. She could see herself on a, on a boat uh, down the Caribbean and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm a very fond individual and I love education. I love reading. And reading is probably the most important platform before we get into science, math, et cetera, reading has to be the most important thing that kids have to learn. I, I love that. Now, what was your favorite book as a child? My favorite book as a child, I, I kid you not, was Dr. Seuss, <laughs> Green Eggs and Ham. <laughs> And uh, I always thought that was so, the way they, the pictures in the, uh, the way the, the words to be able to see the words, the way to see how they, they took the artistic uh, characters and, and made it come come to life. And so I was a big Dr. Seuss fan as a kid, as a kid, but also my comic books, Superman and Iron Man and the Fantastic Four and the Incredible Hawk was another gateway for my favorite books. I couldn't I could never ever stop reading. Uh, and uh, and then some of the old Western books, you know, Billy the Kid and the OK Corral and, uh, and, and imagining these books. So they, that was some of my, my books as a kid. <laughs> wow, that is super. Because as you know, my dad was also military. And that's how he connected with me. He loved comic books. He would give me my dime or my nickel and we would go down to the train station and we would swap comic books. And so that's how I started just loving comic books. My dad, I love you, dad. Rest in peace and rest in power. So those things, and I'm glad you said that because as long as you're reading, folks, and I want you to get this out here, Dr. Lamb, as long as you're reading, whether it's comics books, whether it's a fiction book, whether it's science fiction, a thriller, or whatever, however your child is reading, it's important because it's a gateway to the future. Now, <laughs> absolutely, and I and I and I, I tell folks, uh, you know, as a professor. Uh, in one of my different roles and different hats, I, every class I start, I don't care if I'm uh, teaching at uh, Weber State University or Utah Valley State, or I'm teaching at University of Nevada Reno Medical School, or I'm teaching in Germany, or I'm teaching at uh, giving seminars at all the historical black colleges. My first thing I always tell the kids, the young folks, is that the most important thing is you have to be able to read. And when I say read, read is so reading is so incredibly important. When I say read, I mean you have to read and understand every word and take the time. When you cannot understand that particular word in a phrase, you have to look it up. And because that one phrase might be the difference of the whole uh, conceptual uh, concept of that particular meaning. So for kids out there, for anybody listening to this, reading is the most critical thing, and it is the gateway to math, science, and life. And that's an epic statement. You heard it right here from Dr. Rowling. Now, Dr. Rowling, 
we know that you're a very busy man. What are you reading right now? And what are some of your recommendations for books for kids? Well, right now, I'm, I'm you know, I'm in a, right in the middle of uh, teaching. So I'm, I'm going over human anatomy and physiology. I'm studying infectious diseases. I'm studying microbiology and stuff like that. But for me, I think one of the things I would recommend for kids right now, because I got this from my grandchildren, is uh, Kid National Geographic Magazine. Absolutely fantastic reading. And I think all parents should get that as one of their one of the bases or one of a, a compound or different uh, reading material but get kids national geographic kids magazine and you will be amazed the stunning illustration and also the the, the, the be able to understand the words in there because it's written for kids that is absolutely amazing now you know this time flies we got to take a quick break run a few commercials, pay some bills, and we're going to be right back with Dr. Lane Rowley here on the Pick TV Network. In 1977, Jackson State University has been training students for a life of service and leadership to impact our global society. Ranked among the best HBCUs in the country, Jackson State University offers 47 undergraduate, 37 masters, one specialist, and 13 doctoral degree programs. Whether you're interested in the arts, education, public health, the sciences, or business, we're here to take you from ready to JSU ready. Visit jsums.edu and apply today. Thank you for staying with us. This is an epic segment with Dr. Lane Rowling ND. He's an amazing man. He's done some amazing things. And he's telling us all about not only his life, but how he got into the joy of reading. Now, you're talking about reading and comprehension. When we talk about the technicalities of especially medicine, Every word counts. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Every word counts. And this is where I think we have to have more, you know, discipline in reading. And when we talk to our kids is that we have to tell them that reading is the gateway, but every word in a sentence has meaning to it. And you can never, ever skip over a word. When I was younger, you know, we, we were lazy. I would read something and if I didn't understand the word, it was too big to pronounce. I would skip over that. And at the end of the day, I was wrong on the whole conception of what the meaning of that particular passage was. And so what I've learned is that every word you read, you have to understand and take the time to look it up. In fact, I always say you got a book, you, have, you should have your companion dictionary with that. Uh, you can get a kid's dictionary to help the kids look up the words that they don't understand. And if the kids do not understand that word, ask an adult say, hey, can you tell me what that word is? Because the conceptual reading is for every word to be read and every word to be understood and every word to be seen. Well, that's why it's so important. And that's why there's such power in words because we really have to dive down deep and know their meaning. That way, when we say things, we are giving factual information, even little things. That's why I love making sure that my, all my kids got a dictionary. My mom gave me a dictionary. It's very vital and it's very important. Well, now, I, yeah, sorry about that. But yeah, but absolutely, like you said, dictionary has to go along with the book. Now, Dr. Rowling, you're an amazing and you're a highly intelligent and very smart man. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened to you in your childhood, if you don't mind sharing? Because even though we know that you're phenomenal, there are places where people didn't think so when you were younger. Can you share that? Yeah, I, I think one of the, the things that we have to understand, and this is, this is the reality of our society, and it's not sugarcoating it, it's not drinking the Kool-Aid, is that you know a lot of black kids, and especially males, are always kind of marginalized in, the, in, in school. Uh, we seem to be more, uh, get more disciplinary action 
uh, we get harsher measures uh, and then we're classified in a particular category. And I know for me back in 1972, 75, as a, as a young elementary uh, kid, and even when I was six years old going into kindergarten, my, my teacher at that time told my mother that I was uh, mentally retarded, that I needed to be put in special ed. And uh, my mother went to school and said, no, my, 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 my boy Sid is not uh, mentally challenged. He's not retarded. Sid's just bored. When she was talking about four plus four, I was thinking about nine times nine. But at the end of the day, they tried to classify me as somebody to be in special education, and that wasn't the case. All us kids, we develop at a different rate. Some move faster, some move slower, but we can never, ever measure a kid's capabilities. It's not, your capabilities are not defined until it's the end game. And maybe it's never at the end game, i.e., you know, I'm, I'm six years old and somebody's telling me I'm, I'm mentally retarded. A white teacher in particular, because that's what white folks did, because education was a tool back then. If you kept black people from reading, they couldn't vote. You kept uh, black people from reading. You 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 scratched out education. There was no advancement. Uh, and then and then what happens is that you end up standing. The reality is that they use education as a part of slavery and a part of uh, segregation to keep a particular population in the dark. And when you, when you, so for our generation, it was a big thing, part of the, I would call the social mo movement of trying to keep, especially black males, uh, you know, uh, you know, down. And so one of the things I think is very important, we have to understand where we came from. And when you read and you understand, you can question things, you can imagine things, you can see things. If you can't read, how can you imagine what your future can be? How can you imagine to be motivated or inspired to go go places and stuff? So for me, as a young kid, at six years old, being told I was retarded uh, and I was special ed, it's amazing now uh, at my age, uh, you know, fast forward, I have six degrees, uh, BS in microbiology and chemistry, minor in military science, master's degree in cellular molecular genetics, I'm published for research, you know, two doctor degrees. I've been all over the world. How does somebody who's mentally retarded at six years old go ahead, goes in life and does what I do? So what happened? I get hit in the head too much playing football and I got some sense knocked in me. But no, what that was was a, a stigma that they did purposely uh, on, on black uh, kids in general, but in particular black young males. And at the end of the day, I was able to overcome that. And I still remember that today vividly from that happening, you know, 50 plus years ago, and that has always been my motivating factor in understanding, uh, do not let anybody uh, categorize you, uh, pigeonhole you into a thing. In fact, I remember my youngest son, uh, Nathan Rowling, he's a first lieutenant uh, in the U.S. Army, uh, getting ready to get deployed to Africa, Djibouti, Cape Horn, Africa for a year. And when he was a kid, I remember going to the school, uh, like uh, one of the PTA meetings, and I going, went to have my one-on-one -on -one, uh, teaching thing with him, uh, with his professor, a teacher at that time. And he, my teacher was telling me, you know what, your son is slow. Your son uh, is, is not very bright. Your son needs to be put in, uh, you know, remedial education, special ed. And I and I and I so I, I listened to this teacher, and all of a sudden I went out and, and I went and, and got my son Nathan in some, in some uh, what was it called uh, Silver Learning Center uh, for tutoring after school, paying a thousand dollars a month. My kid would go to school from eight in the morning till three in the afternoon, pick him up, and he'd go to the Silver Learning Center for three hours. The kid was tired. I mean, he was tired. And but at the end of the day, after about a month of my son being tortured because some teacher told me that your son was this. I remember what I went through and says, hey, I told that teacher, my son is fine. Nathan's going to develop when he wants to develop. And sure enough, my son, Nathan Rowling, the kid that they tried to pigeonhole in the, in the, in the 1990s or 2000, he was a first lieutenant, got his BS degree in healthcare administration and science from a military academy. And he's a first lieutenant. Now my son's getting ready to finish his master's degree in one month at the University of Utah in public health. First lieutenant. How does a kid in the in our time becomes all that and the kid can read? And I always stress to him, reading, reading, reading. But the light bulb came on when I gave him his first book. 
of Harry Potter and it was over for him. Wow, that is amazing because my nephew, that was it's one of his favorite series. <laughs> and he's always telling me it's like, because he had gotten into a little, little trouble. And I'm like, reading is going to be your gateway. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. And so <laughs> while he was in, I would always send him books. He was like, can I have this book? Can I have it? I'm like sending him books, sending him books. So now his love of reading, he's sharing with his kids. Let me tell you something, uh, Ms. Cox. Uh, my son, Nathan, once I opened that light bulb to him when he was in the seventh grade, I would, we would go to Barnes and Nobles and I'll say, get any book in here you want to get. And man, he was buying uh, you know, all the different series, Harry Potter, uh, you know, uh, the, all the books, you know, all the series of kids' books at that time. And let me tell you something. I would spend $70, $80 on books. He'll get three or four of them, maybe five books. And do you know within 48 hours, he read them all? And I would get, I would say, slow down. And I have to go buy more books because his appetite for reading, and it, 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 it was like, oh, my God, I created a reading monster. And he read and he read. I, I, I probably bought 5,000 books from the time he was uh, seven and from the seventh grade until he started college and stuff. But the kid became a fabulous reader. And because he could read, he can write. He could do anything. He could do math. He could do science. His areas that he felt that he was weak in, and for example, taking a course like biostatistics, he excelled in it because the kid could read. And it's a beautiful thing reading. I know for a fact what I went through and what his what he went through, that reading is so important. And that's why he's a first lieutenant, all American, uh, you know, serving our country, uh, you know, Nathan Rowling. And so he's a product of what you can do if you tell the kids learning how to read. That is absolutely phenomenal. Now, you've kind of shared how reading is very structured and important in your life. My thing is, and we talked a little bit about the stigma around being a black male and what society or the status quo can do to black males. But I also know that boys a lot of times have a hard time quieting their mind. How can we help our parents out there in TV land direct our boys to read more and better? How can we give them those still moments? What can we do like you did with your son to help them read more? Well, one of the things that this new generation that we have, and I don't know what generation it is, I don't know if it's generation P, Z, whatever they call themselves, but what I found out that with my son, we started using uh, back then, you know, PS4, Xbox, that became like the babysitter. And my, my son, Nathan, could sit there and play games for 10 hours. And I saw in that, that man, they are so focused and these kids are so intelligent, they could figure out how to navigate through a puzzle navigate to a different level in, in, in the game series uh, and they will always be successful in, in getting more and more. And I said, if, if your kid is so successful in playing that, they should be able to be successful in, in doing anything in life. So what I said, hey man, no more. If you want to, this is a trade-off. You play your game for two hours, you read for four hours. You play your game for five hours, you read for 10 hours. It was always a trade-off and that was it. How many books should you read? Okay, I, I read these books. Okay, you can play your game for two hours. But it wasn't a, it had to be a, a that was the, the reward. You read, you play your game. Not the other way around where they dictate it and you have to take that console from them, turn it off and say, here, go go read. And better yet, take your kids to the uh, bookstore and say, go in the book section. Barnes and Nobles are uh, the local bookstore in your neighborhood and go, hey, Go to that section, find a book that you uh, that you like to read. And so when I remember taking him to Barnes and Nobles, and I'll sit up there, he'll be in there for an hour, going through all the different books, finding a book that made him motivated that he wanted to read. And one way I think we can help uh, you know, motivate and, and and mold that individual into what we're trying to get done, learning how to read. Well, that is fantastic advice, parents. You heard it here. Now, of course, this time goes by fast. We've got to take another commercial break, and we'll be right back with my amazing guest, Dr. Lane Rowland, MD, and the importance and power of reading. 
Are you a company, business, or service that believes in social responsibility? Would you like to make a positive impact? You can. You can sponsor this program and be seen by 2 million viewers on the PIC TV network. Call 770-367-1268 for more information today. You're watching the PIC TV network on YouTube. Hi, folks. We're back with the importance and power of reading. I'm your host, Michelle, the computer lady, and we have a phenomenal guest, Dr. Lane Rowling, MD. He has been giving us so much wisdom on how we can take our boys, especially into this reading journey. It's like you've got a PS5 and they like to play a game. You can see that they can focus. Now there's some trade-offs and that is awesome. Now, I have to ask you, as an educator, as a professional, what do you think the state of literacy is in the United States for our young men and our young women? And well, what can we do about it? Well, I think what I've seen, uh, I think several years ago, I saw a statistical analysis of where we ranked at in education uh, in, in the world. And we're probably maybe 50 in the world when it comes to literacy and stuff like that. And this is just the reality. Uh, America, we, we have a projection of what we perceive that we are. But when we look at reading, math, and science, we're not we're not very good at it. And that tells you that we're lacking something versus these kids from China versus kids from Japan, uh, these kids from European, uh, the European Union are from Europe and stuff like that. And so our literacy rate is where it is and because if the literacy rate, our literacy rate was so great, then we would be much more higher in the ratings in the world and stuff. And I think a lot of our problems is that our education, we assume that our kids are getting the, the, the basic fundamentals. But in the reality, when we look at uh, competing against a kid from Japan or a kid from uh, Germany or a kid from, uh, you know, the Netherlands, we're far behind because of the reading. And I think reading is very important on that. Well, since we got into it, right now there are book bannings going on all over the place. Hmm. I want you to look at the parents out there and tell them what they can do about banned books because we know it's a simple solution. Yeah, I mean, a simple solution is that you can get any book you want. Uh, and I always I always thought, you know, why if somebody uh, is prohibiting you from doing something, why is it so important for you to try to go in that front door? You can still get it, you know, uh, or for example, you know, uh, people don't want uh, black folks to go to their restaurant and feed them, hey, we'll create our own restaurant. And I've always taken that, that mentality that you can always get something done if you really truly want to get done and stuff. And, you know, and, and don't worry about it because the information is already out there and stuff. I think it's very important that uh, our parents in the, in our, in, in, in the school system, i.e. in their local community stuff, understand uh, you know, that they, they have power. They have power in numbers because your tax dollars are the ones that pay for public education, some places private education. And so the reality is that when you are you have a voice and when you go in front of that school board, you need to tell them this is what you want, what you require, what you think is important for, you, for your child in this new modern day. And so banned books is not the way to go. I think the way it is is that uh, people should have the opportunity to choose and pick the books they want to read. Uh, you know, I want my kids to read a certain material and stuff. You know, and if there's materials I don't want my kids to read, I'm going to make sure my kids don't don't read that. But at the end of the day, when you start banning books, what happens? You really start banning information. Uh, and 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 the most important thing is the information is life itself. But also, the information has to be controlled and introduced to kids at a certain age and stuff like that. You know, and I think one of the big things that we're seeing now, I don't want my my five or six year old kid uh, grandchild or my uh, nine or 10 year old, uh, you know, uh, cousin reading things uh, that's sexual. I mean, when I was kids at five, six, seven years old, I was worried about my Oreo cookie and taking my nap, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to learn how to tie my shoe, you know, or get the safety badge you know that was that's that was my so we have to have uh, controlled uh, uh, educational uh, in introducing certain material at a certain age but we also do not need to ban books and I think it's very important for the, the, the individual uh, family uh, can uh, introduce books that they feel appropriate for their kids and stuff like that 
But at the end of the day, it's all about freedom of choice and having access to information. Well, see, I like what you did. Not only should it be age appropriate, but you took your son to the library. You took your son to the bookstore. Hey, you don't, you don't have to worry about banned books because they're not banning books at the bookstore. <laughs> Create your own libraries at home. If we do that, we don't have to worry about banned books. Keep buying books, keep bringing books in, and you're always going to have a good source of reading materials that you approve of as a parent. Well, Michelle, you're an author. And at the end of the day, uh, we're where we're at uh, because of information. I'm a doctor because of information I had to learn. Uh, you know, uh, you're an author and a, and, and a computer expert because you had information to learn. That's what books are supposed to do is gives you information to learn. But the most important thing it has to be age appropriate. And at the end of the day, you're really wasting a lot of energy. But who cares if they ban a book or not ban a book? You've got access to a create your own library. That's one of the things I love is that my library is extensive. And my mother, bless her heart, uh, you know, uh, 79-year-old Edith Rowling from Louisiana, little black girl and her bow ties and all that stuff, who came from a family that couldn't read. My mother has more books than you can imagine. And she reads four or five books a day at her, or at her, her, her beautiful 79 young age and but she's reading these romance books and stuff and i go mom why are you reading that book i just love i just love that love stuff and i just it just breaks my heart because it's so beautiful but my mother at 79 years old is able to read and i want people out to understand it i remember about two years ago my mother uh eyesight started getting bad and she goes and, and i go what's going on she said i, I can't read my book so i took to the eye doctor and my mother had cataracts and so I made sure that my mom cataract surgery got fixed because her eyes were her key to her world in reading books. And my mother cannot live without reading her books. And just like I took my kids to the Barnes and Nobles, I take my mom to Barnes and Nobles. I take her to Save Mine. She buys all the books, but she is 79 years old still reading and reading is her gateway like it was when she was a kid to the world and i love that i love that that is what makes my heart happy now we know and you you and i you said we're educators and we write stem i'm in computers you're in technology you're in technology you're in science you're in math <laughs> and you're in engineering because you do everything right how can we bring our love for stem to the children and how can we really ramp up their thirst for knowledge around these areas? Because as you know, we already talked about how we're deficient in reading, but we're also deficient in STEM. Give us a few pointers of how to bring our children on into this new age of STEM and technology. Well, to me, I think what's happening, uh, just what I've seen around the country, because I've lectured, uh, you look at my lecture series, uh, on the road for the last, you know, 20 years. I've been at every historical black college in America. Uh, I've uh, worked with their students. I've been, you know, probably 50 plus uh, PWIs, uh, schools, white universities, and given seminars and taught their students. But at the but at the end of the day, the reality is that the word STEM has been kind of uh, overused because you science, technology, engineering, math is great, and people getting funding for it. But what is the end result is that we haven't really changed anything because we still lack black engineers. We still lack uh, mathematicians. We still uh, lack people in, in, in the computer world. And what, I, what I'm saying that folks, and I'm not criticizing, but we have to have people that are teaching STEM that are motivated, they're inspired. They're not just teaching it because it's STEM. They have a, a vested interest in it. When I teach STEM, I'm loving it. I'm motivated because I'm teaching science, hard, complex biochemistry processes and understanding uh, a human anatomy and physiology and life chemistry and virology. And I'm bringing it down to a level that makes it exciting. When I was teaching yesterday, you know, I was surprised. And, and, uh, several students goes, my God, I'm inspired. You're making me inspired. I want to learn more. Yeah, I, I want to do more homework. And this is what we have to have. We have to have the, the mentor who is teaching the program just as motivated and not just be teaching STEM just because of STEM. I think that's 
absolutely correct because as a, an instructor, I go in there fired up. Number one, I love it. And so for the teachers out there, we understand that right now it's challenging. But if you don't love it, the children won't love it. They won't gravitate to it. Also, folks at home, there are simple ways to teach STEM at home. Baking is a science. Cooking is a science. You got measurements, you got weights, pounds, ounces, all of these things that you can do to help our kids learn STEM in what you you feel as your limited capacity, but it's a whole new world for them. So don't forget about the small ways to teach. How many ounces in a gallon? Those kind of things. How much, if you read your bills, your electric bills, what's a kilowatt? Those are all part of STEM. I want you to think on that level because everybody thinks about STEM and they get afraid. You don't have to be afraid. They're common everything, everyday things that we do that surround STEM. So I want to give that gift to you. Now, you talked about taking your son to bookstore, you're taking your mom to bookstores, and you talked about your library. Can you tell everybody at home how important it is for us to have books in our homes for the children to read? Oh, absolutely. In fact, you know, I think it should be mandatory that we have books for your kids, a book series for children, or a book series for teenager, uh, uh, dictionaries and stuff, and build that library. It's just a, it's just a warm, beautiful feeling when you go to a bookstore, and an antique bookstore, and you have all the books on the shelves, and sometimes you can smell the coffee in the background. Or you see the, the old, the old big old uh, lazy board chair, the leather one, and somebody's in the corner with a little yellow light reading a book, going into the world. And so that type of environment is what we have to create. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the basketball court sometimes should be a little book room. And sometimes maybe the football field needs to be that book room. But everybody should try to create a space in your home, a reading space that people can go and, and zone out, I say, read and go to different places. Uh, you know, I remember when I was in uh, medical school at Drake Library in Des Moines, Iowa, they had a, in the library, people don't realize they have a periodic section down in the basement. I mean, articles from 150 years ago. And in these periodic areas in the library, they have a little table with a little yellow light. And I remember when I used to get done with my, my classes in medical school, I would get in my car, I would drive as fast as I can to the, the, the great uh, library, law library, go downstairs and get my little spot with my Snickers bar. And I sit up there in that little, that little space with that little yellow light. And I would zone out into my studies and stuff. And that's the type of environment you have to have. That safe space of what I call that safe reading space that motivates you. With that yellow light and that Snickers bar. I love it. I love it. I love it. Now, in summary, Dr. Rowland, give us two or three books that you would recommend for young people, because you gave us a magazine, but two or three books, and they, they can be children's books, they can be uh, books for adolescents or teenagers. You go. I think one of the books that I, I really recommend is the Harry Potter series, uh, which is uh, uh, a beautiful set of, of, of books talking about magic, and magic is science, and, 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 and flying in the air. And that, that series is a great book. I read it. I, I would be on an airplane in first class with my Harry Potter book. Here I am, I'm a surgeon. I'm a doctor. And people look over and look at me and go, what are you reading? I'm reading, I'm reading Harry Potter. So that's a beautiful series to read. I would even recommend for, uh, for folks out there reading the uh, Dr. Seuss books. Un unbelievable, simple reading take home uh, message, big words with big color pictures is another series. And I think another one that I would really highly, highly recommend to all uh, kids, especially, uh, you know, kids that, you know, are kind of on, on, on the thing. I think you should read Peter Pan. And Peter Pan is a great series too. Our Treasure Island is another one. Uh, and then if you really want to get technical, you know, uh, you know, H.G. Wells, you know, books on, uh, you know, on his, you know, 20,000 League Under the Sea. You know, there's so many books that people can read and kids should read. 
I think the Moby Dick series of books is a beautiful uh, series of books and stuff. You know, these books that we read, Great Expectations, is another one. You know, I, I can go down the list of all the books that I've read and I continue to read. Uh, it is beautiful. And so I think any book in your library, it should be a combination of a multitude of different areas from serious books like, you know, uh, you know, uh, Great Expectations to books like Harry Potter, where you can dream about riding on a broom and playing Quidditch with the with the hockey stick and stuff like that, hitting a magical ball. <laughs> I love it. And just for me, The Great Aviators is a good book as well. We're talking about blacks right. and aviation. Mm -hmm. um, and don't forget, any comic book that your child gravitates to, especially when we're talking about Doctor Strange, the Fantastic Four, because it has a lot of science principles. So they'll have fun, be entertained while they read. Well, I tell you, Dr. Roland, the mandatory book that you have to have, these were books you're talking about, but the, the, the mandatory books we have to have, because you grew up on it too, you gotta have comic books. And at my age, at my nice age of 59, I still buy comic books, folks. People are shocked. I'm in a comic book store. I got comic books that are Fantastic Four, Incredible Hawk, uh, Luke Cage, Power Man, you know, Doctor Strange, uh, Thor. I can go down. Uh, it, it's you like say, you know, Captain America and the Falcon. Comic books is always a go-to book that I think kids really need to have because it's a basic foundation. <laughs> So, folks, you've heard it here from my illustrious guest, Dr. Lane Rowling, MD, PhD, <laughs> infectious medicine and disease trauma surgeon and retired Army officer. As long as it's in a book and you're reading it, you're giving your child a gateway to the world. Thank you so much, for, Dr. Rowling, for blessing us with this interview. You are phenomenal. Keep on shining your light. And I cannot wait to do more work with you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure to be able to promote education and, and promote positivity in this world. Because I think at the end of the day, we have to take our, our next generation of kids and we have to make them better. You know, you you were a military dependent trading comic books. That's what we did. We traded comic books. Hey, let me have let me have the Silver Surfer. You take the Fantastic Four. We did that, and so we have to make sure that we be able to really start stimulating uh, these kids and not just talking about it. We have to have results. I mean, there's it's only so many feel-good programs you can do. And at the end of the day, we have to have uh, a, a, a positive effect. And so thank you for letting me come on your program. I look forward to working with you in any uh, capacity to promote reading to kids because kids are our future, and it, it is always bright. And they can read and see it, and they can understand, they can achieve it. You're so very right. Wow, everybody, that was a phenomenal interview. You heard it here. Dr. Lane Rolling, MD, he's giving you poignant ways to make sure that your kids read. And we talked about banned books. Not to worry about the banned books, get other books. Just in case you didn't know, Dr. Martin Luther King authored five books. One of them is Strength to Love and the other one is Community or Chaos. Where do we go from here? Recommended reading for you. We'll see you next time on The Importance and Power of Reading. I'm Michelle, the computer lady, your host. Have a awesome and reading day. Hi, I'm Michelle, the computer lady author and children's book publisher of the Mommy Reader's Collection series of books. Well, we know how important it is for us to read, but we also know how important our public hospitals are. We're here in Atlanta. My public hospital is Grady. They saved my life. And I would like to give back and I need your help to do so. I've created a new fundraiser called Building Towards Our Future. And what's going to happen is we're going to make sure, you and I together, that Grady keeps on serving the marginalized, the poor, and the indigent 
in the Atlanta metro area. All right. Stay tuned for more announcements. I'm going to be telling you how real soon. Thank you for joining me in this fight to make sure that we can live with Grady. You know what's going on in our society, book banning, and over 38 million children don't have books in their homes. Join me for some exciting segments as we talk about the importance and power of reading with my guest, Mr. Richard Ashby Jr., the boss librarian on the PIC TV network.